Hello and welcome to Conversations with the Voice of Reason. I'm your host, Benjamin Boyce, and today's conversant is Andreas, who is an Eastern European middle-aged man who, from puberty, had wrestled with feelings of wanting to be or to become a woman, otherwise known as autogynephilia, which is a Blanchardian term, meaning the desire for oneself as a woman. These feelings persisted and they were pretty intense throughout his development and into his 30s. And then a series of intellectual and spiritual developments allowed him to free himself from this pressure. In this conversation, we speak about his life story and talk about the politics of gender in general. I'm very proud of this particular conversation. I've been working on trans and detrans interviews for almost four years now, and uh, it's been particularly difficult to find the insider voice for the male uh, part of this issue, especially the desistance issue. And so Andreas presents a uh, very positive outlook for people who do not want to affirm their gender dysphoria. So without further ado, here is Andreas. How long have you been thinking about gender or in terms of gender? And what is gender to you? Well, obviously there is a bit of language barrier because yeah, English is not my native language. So I, in my local language, I don't have distinct words for gender and sex like it's in English. So. I think originally, as I was thinking and uh, formulating my ideas, I was just using the sex base. And this gender uh, kind of, it appeared quite recently actually online, maybe last five years or something. I don't think it, people were talking about it previously. Yeah. No, it, it caught fire um, this past decade. Yeah, I know. Has it always been uh, kind of a fascinating topic to you? I mean, I guess uh, sexual dim- dimorphism, the difference between the sexes, uh, what a man is, what a woman is culturally. I don't think I'm, I was interested in that, that intellectually. I was rather involved from a more uh, visceral, more feeling side mm-hmm. inside. And I think this is a bit connected to my own experience. And um, maybe we could just start from that. Yeah, let's start. Let's start with that. Let's start with your experience. Mm -hmm. So I think my first (laughs) uh, kind of stumble upon... uh, gender identity was something very early, like, um, I don't know, I don't remember it myself, but my mother told me stories that uh, she kind of uh, liked to dress me somewhat ambiguously. And uh, when she was, uh, when I was one or two years old, and she was taking me somewhere in public places and someone come and say, ooh, what a nice girl here. And uh, I would say, fuck off, scary lady. I'm a boy. <laughs> uh, so I think at that time, my that gender slash sex identity was pretty solid. Mm. I think uh, the first uh, somewhat cross gender feelings or thoughts were arriving about when I was six. I remember having intense daydreams at that time, various, and one of those was kind of recurring, what it would be like to have breasts on my body. And it was somewhat exciting, but not yet sexually exciting, just, I don't know, curious or something. Mm -hmm. But yeah, at that time I was was also curious what it's like to be a cat or what it's like to be a unicorn. So Mm -hmm. I don't pay much weight to it. Yeah, I think um, then when I was at the second grade, uh, that's like eight years 
I uh, vividly remember something. So in our country, we have something like Halloween, but it's not in autumn, but rather in spring. What's it called? I don't think it has exact translation into English because... language, but it's kind of, um, it's called Ushgavenes. Ushgavenes. Yes. And uh, it's kind of um, ending the winter uh, celebration. And people dress up and they go and trick and treating like that. And uh, I remember our our yeah, our teacher told a story that, okay, once she had a, a, an incident when a boy from her class kind of cross-dressed as a girl and came in uh, during that uh, celebration and nobody was able to detect him and just, well, what's a strange girl doing in my class? But anyway, we have to go <laughs> to the celebration and kind of stuck with me yeah wow it was it's possible to do that and mm. it's kind of um then i remember another scene like a few years later uh, we were playing with a friend and somehow a friend said that, well you know if you are able to uh, do three knots on your hair you can turn into a girl i said really and then I tried that actually. <laughs> but I have short hair. <laughs> and uh, somehow these ideas were coming from somewhere into my head, and uh, I didn't yet know consciously what to do with those. But and then I think in the at the start of middle school and the, well puberty somewhere, the beginning of it, then it hit uh, fully, like. Uh, and uh, I was really confused at that time. It was, um, yeah, I started to get some quite intense feeling, I would say, to, um, well, I want to be a girl, something like that. Or I want to cross-dress. Or I want to, um, yeah, something. And it was quite intense. I had it, of course, quite inside of me not showing what kind of a secret because yeah i knew at that time that it's probably not normal to be like that and I was ashamed of that and i was repressing those feelings quite a lot inside me and um, that cost me quite a lot because yeah i got socially isolated from my peers hmm. and um, even before that, before, you know, this kind of conscious realization, I, I kind of for a long time knew that something was off, you know, about me. Something like I was too sensitive maybe for a boy, as I, so I was yeah, very sensitive, very intelligent, and I would cry easily. Like okay. That. Yeah. So could you just expand on what you mean by sensitive, like words would hurt you or uh, commercials yeah. would uh, affect you or something like that? Words, especially. So yeah. um, it was quite easy to make me cry for things that maybe not that significant when I look in the retrospective, but, you know, and uh, yeah, I would also quite be so yeah whenever i was watching some movie or something i would get really into those characters and really kind of uh, go with their emotions and uh, mm. so yeah i would cry at movies and stuff mm. like that did you have any dawning um artistic uh, impetus or uh, did you want to draw or write or were you a big reader or I don't think I don't I wouldn't call myself as having an artistic calling but uh, writing was probably the best outlet for me so journaling I kind of and it helped me a lot because yeah I would I would have feelings inside which I didn't understand but at least I could write them down and uh, it 
somewhat helped. Mm -hmm. So this was also kind of self-therapy for me, I would guess. And eventually, yeah, since I was doing quite a lot, I think I got better at writing in general. What about school? What what were the what were you good at scholastically or mechanically? I was um, good at many things. I think math, especially physics, uh, the um, science stuff. Okay, yeah. but uh, kind of other things like literature itself i was also quite excelling mm. but maybe not my strongest point mm -hmm. so yeah um this was quite a confusing time uh, at that moment and there was also the environment that i was currently uh, at that time it was some what yeah 90s it's kind of um i would say it was quite hostile towards um, um people who maybe didn't fit in for mm -hmm. some reason mm -hmm. and especially like you know the worst thing you could be at that time was yeah, being gay for example so everyone was really hostile towards that and uh, uh and I, yeah, I felt that if I told publicly towards my peers or even to my parents or to any of my friends, not that I didn't have any, um, I would just be kind of ridiculed and uh, bullied, etc. And just for context, in the 90s, was your country a part of the uh, Soviet Union or what was politically, geopolitically, uh, the influence on the cultural level? Because there's a lot of changes oh. going on in yeah. your so general I born, Yeah, I was born in USSR, which yeah. no longer exists, but it broke up uh, after 1990. Yeah. So, uh, so this was already happening in a new, fresh, independent state. But yeah, yeah we kind of were, we had a legacy from the previous culture, which was still quite strong but uh, we also had a uh, um, growing influence from the west so uh, it was kind of <laughs> we got from both worlds the best and the worst actually mm. hmm. so uh, i just uh, i think that that's a interesting background that your culture or your country is going through a huge major shift politically yeah. and culturally while you are going through a major shift physically and psychically yes so it's just kind of the backdrop of what's going on but you were you didn't say that there's a lot of homophobia um at that point in time yeah um i would definitely agree to that and did you consider yourself to be gay or did you have words for how to put how your feelings were uh, at that developing. time, I was not that concerned maybe about attraction. Yeah. Uh, this came result a bit later, but this was more about, okay, who I am like and uh, about, yeah, sex identity, about, uh, about identity itself. Hmm. And uh, I was dreading puberty quite a lot, you know, uh, kind of really didn't want to get body hair and cracking voice and things <laughs> like that it was very frightening and kind of um, even more confusing. So, yeah, on top of that, there were also kind of troubles within my family. So... Um, my parents went through divorce when I was seven. Then my mother was a very domineering, I would say, with some narcissistic personality traits. Well, she's quite a picture. And uh, mm. um, I think, yeah, me and my sister, she gave quite a lot of traumas 
psychological and, and emotional end. Mm -hmm. um, so it was not easy growing up. And on top of that, yeah, I didn't have any friends at school because um, I was very withdrawn, very already bullied by everyone yeah, mm -hmm. at school. And uh, kind of, yeah, just hanging on and, uh, yeah, whatever energy I had, I just poured into academic achievements. Mm -hmm. Did you have a a steady uh, male role model? Was your father near or involved at all? Or did you guys have a stepfather? Nope. So, hmm. well, there are, there were males, of course, around uh, like yeah, my father, I was seeing him from time to time. And uh, yeah, my mother married a second time. So that was, but n there were none that I could identify or kind of mm -hmm. talk or kind of feel intimate connection with well, intimate not romantic or anything but just you know being open and trusting so uh, i think i didn't have a single male role model that i could look up to mm. it was either they were very distant or they were very mm, I don't know. I would describe them as blunt, cruel, which I kind of just didn't want to identify with those mm -hmm. people. Or they were drinking or, you know, having bad influence. So, um, and yeah, I didn't see signs of empathy in men around me. And just kind of, I got the picture that they are kind of self-absorbed. They don't show feelings. And uh, they are kind of different. And I didn't want to become like them. Mm -hmm. In your country or where you grew up, had the Soviets uh, disbanded all religion? Was there a religious tradition at all? or a sense of psychological well-being at all? Just a place where humans can be humans and beauty and the internal life is adulated and explored? Or had that been kind of demolished? It was somewhat, but it was limited. Um, so during Soviet times, most of this was underground, actually. But uh, yeah, after regaining independence it became kind of free to go etc but still even in those institutions like in the uh, well catholic church is the main uh, church over here i just you know i didn't feel i could go to a priest and talk about my condition about my feelings i had a feeling that I would be misunderstood, I would be rejected, maybe. Um, however, me, myself, I consider m myself religious, even though I'm not that hard, I'm not that connected to the official church, but yeah, sometimes I go and uh, uh, I believed more like, you know, more direct connection, so direct mm -hmm. prayers. And I was actually praying quite a lot during that time. Oh, God, please make me a goal and stuff mm. like that. Okay. And, uh, and why did you want to be a girl? Was it based on attraction or based on a sense of you'd be free from the responsibilities and the harshness of what you see a man was? Was there something that you wanted to escape to or from? I, it's hard to determine exactly why it was, but I would say the root of it, like uh, it was somewhat kind of irrational feeling that was just at the back of the mind that kind of constantly reminded that and it just went on and on and on and on and kind of constant replay. And uh, whenever I did something that pushed me toward. So for example, I cross-dressed or some thing like that, then kind of 
rewarded me. But I felt empowered at that time. I felt like, um, yeah, more alive, I would say. Mm, okay. Uh, more authentic, more in tune with myself uh, compared to my like, regular experience. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, there were maybe a few things which I didn't know what to make of it at that time. Uh, but uh, later, yeah, when I read about, uh, uh, just a few years, I read about autogenophilia theory by Blanchard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also read an uh, interesting book, Men Trapped in Men's Bodies by Anne Lawrence, yeah. uh, which is also on the same subject. And uh, well, they just collected a lot of experiences and uh, I kind of found bits and pieces which were quite interesting. For example, after having kind of auto-erotic experience with myself, uh, this feeling uh, suddenly vanished for a few hours. So it's kind of replayed 24 hours a day, but after this, it just go on mute for a few hours. Okay. So it's a constant kind of pressure, a constant yeah. pressure, and then it would relax, and then it would kind of come back in. Yeah. And another thing, yeah, this is coming a bit you know, towards, yeah, romantic. So I think it was about 15 when I first realized attraction, so that I'm attracted to girls, actually. And there was, yeah, one girl in my class, which I was kind of yeah feeling this growing attraction and didn't know at first what it was uh, but with this instance and some instances later so i noticed that whenever i fall in love like um this feeling also recedes and it recedes maybe for a longer period of time maybe weeks or months even and this is also something that i found in the other people's experience about autogenophilia that kind of sometimes mysteriously just retreats. Okay. And did you obsess about your body as it changed and became more masculinized? Did you uh, ever fantasize about um, castration or anything like body modification was to in that direction because um, i know that they can be kind of intense in that direction and lawrence has spoken about that yeah so um, not just this desire to be a woman the autogynophilia but this hatred or phobia of being a male can be packaged into it i don't think i had actual hatred but more like dissatisfaction and the thing is that this feeling is kind of growing over time so um, it maybe started from just one intensity and then as time goes it just goes a bit stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and hmm. uh, i think the worst that i had was something seven out of ten so ten i think you are unable to function so and anything above five already interferes with your life yeah so i don't think i had it really really bad like you know trying to harm myself or uh, fantasizing about it but uh, Mostly it was about, yeah, fantasies of how I would live life as a woman, how it would be different from what I have uh, currently, and uh, how would life would be much better mm -hmm. somehow. And through romantic relationships with women or young women at that time, were you able to find people, uh, find girls specifically that you could be intimate with and not just romantically, but to start to speak about your feelings and actually communicate with somebody on a deeper level? 
So not at that time. Uh, so you're still pretty isolated throughout your teen years. Yeah. During, I was completely isolated. Like, hmm. mm, so that one girl that I had a crush on, yeah, I kind of didn't let her know because I was sure that I would be ridiculed and rejected. Hmm. And I was probably right. Um, then what, uh, well, this is a bit forward, but anyway, I had uh, subsequent uh, romantic relationships I'm, well, no. but they were one-sided, always one-sided. So I would find someone interesting. I would kind of fall in love. I would show interest, etc. But I was always rejected, and uh, I gradually became somewhat that kind of these girls can see me through that they that I'm not a real man, and I'm just pretending to be a man. And uh, I can never get their affection because, yeah, I don't feel like a man inside. Hmm. And uh, with this, even, as I said, when I was falling in love, these feelings of wanting to be a woman subsided somewhat. I was still not feeling confident, not feeling man. I was just, you know, like a deer in he headlights. <laughs> and not knowing what to do, et cetera. So yeah, yeah. it was mystery for me, how to get intimate relationships, how to enter that intimate relationship. And I was pretty sure that I would never probably get into intimate relationships because of what I was inside. Hmm. And how did, how does your country, um, how does the education system work? Do you just kind of go into college directly or is there a gap year or is that expected or demanded of the youth to go straight to college or higher ed? We have a similar system as you, so 12 years of just school education. And then we call it university, not college, but anyway, we usually go straight after, but it's not mandatory. Mm -hmm. However, we have it for free. Oh, okay. So, yeah. And what did you end up uh, studying, or how did your scholastic life develop? What What did you end up focusing on? And and I ended up studying computer science. It was actually a bit random at the time, but it worked out well. And uh, this is again one of those things uh, that when I look back now, it's quite of obvious, but it was not obvious then, that uh, even though I was feeling like a girl inside at that time, uh, the actual choices that I was making in my life, uh, interests, hobbies, were very, actually, masculine. Male typical, so, yeah. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, computers, like video games, um, something like that. Uh, I was not that interested in you know, playing with dolls, for example, or, some, or in fashion, or uh, things that would be stereotypically uh, feminine. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So one interesting thing happened uh, at 15 years uh, of age. Uh, I once... Um, just, you yeah, know, the pressure was just building and building, as I said, towards, I don't know, this cr cross gender identity somewhat. And uh, I suddenly realized uh, that I could actually have multiple identities at that time. Sort of like, I don't know, uh, being like a secret agent. So I would imagine that okay i'm secretly a girl inside but i'm this you know giving this facade of male uh, of maleness outside hmm. and this realization somehow it helped me to cope with the pressure and uh, 
um, kind of gave a bit of um, channel, okay, how we could channel that feeling. I would uh, write stories, for example, of, okay, how would I live if I were a girl? And uh, I could live some of this in my head, like in my inner world. And um, yeah, this helped at that time. Hmm. And interestingly, I got more of those feminine personas inside of me. Like it started with one, but okay, then I kind of developed a second one after some time and third one. And uh, uh, they usually were borrowed from some fictional characters. And I just would kind of, which I find uh, something which I admired or I find something in common with myself and just, okay. Uh, yeah, it was kind of an interesting coping mechanism that I kind of self-discovered at that time. Yeah. And this is before the internet uh, was widely accessible, right? So you, you weren't, were you involved in any forums or communities online? The internet was coming at that time, and yeah. uh, I was one of the early adopters because of yeah my interest in computers. Yeah. But uh, I didn't go to forums. Kind of was scared with talking about this with other people. Hmm. Didn't trust anyone online either at that time. Hmm. And uh, yeah. So anyway, a bit going forward. Uh, I think I got out of my family. I moved, yeah, uh, when going to the university, to another city, started living on my own. Eventually, yeah, fa uh, met a few moguls that I liked and was always rejected. I didn't have much friends, unfortunately. And uh, these feelings, as I said, were growing a bit in intensity. And uh, um, kind of, I was doing more serious and serious cross-dressing, mostly in private, but okay, secretly I already fantasized about going into public. And uh, of course, at that time, yeah, internet was already available, much more information was available. So I hmm. kind of was, uh, I drank all the information that was available about transitioning about actual sex change uh, uh, which is available uh, what are the options at least i was kind of educated on that and uh, eventually i think i came to a bad place at about age 27. Um, at that time i kind of felt that yeah i need to do something about it because i just can't go on like that i felt quite isolated from other people i couldn't be authentic uh, i couldn't find intimate relationship with others and just felt lonely misunderstood confused and uh, i really didn't know what to do so that's um yeah that's when i went to therapy hmm. kind of so that was the first time i actually told someone about those feelings and it was initially a relief and i went for about a year but then after that it's um uh, still the question remains so what now hmm. you know uh, what to do and uh, there was no clear answer and uh, despite all my searching for information online um, essentially there were just two possible outcomes which i saw at that time so either i go with transition and I'll take it seriously and take it publicly etc or I somehow desisted and just, you know, continue as if nothing happened, but neither option was very attractive to me. 
Could, we, could you explain why transition itself was not attractive? What was it about it that was not for you, or that you didn't want to deal with? Well, basically, I would have made one ugly bitch. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> So hmm. I kind of, uh, I was realistic about it. I was, uh, um, I knew that it kind of doesn't really change me into a woman. It just gives appearances. And uh, I have a quite yeah, masculine build, I would say, features, etc. It would be hard to pass me as a woman. And uh, I just, was not satisfied with possible option so that were on the table and uh, kind of was thinking okay but what if i regret this at that moment and um, yeah so and there was also still uh, another thing uh, it had a high social cost. So uh, the society at that time was also not accepting of trans people. So yeah, I would lose all my friends, whatever I had. I would probably alienate it from my family. I would just be yeah, completely isolated, alone, with body, which is sort of yeah, woman, but not up to my my ideal yeah what i would like to be and uh, furthermore yeah it would seriously complicate my chances of finding a woman would who would accept me and be intimate with me so yeah it had quite a lot a high cost yeah not not mentioning financial side which uh, yeah financial physical and social those things yeah. you added them up and that did, wasn't appealing the other option that you said was complete desistance but you already tried to let that go and are you trying to resolve that and it just was always there always cropping up i was doing sometimes like uh, yeah like some conscious desistance like uh, yeah i'm gonna man up and uh, i won't do anything to this. I don't. I won't have be having thoughts or do cross dressing or anything for a month or something like that. And uh, yeah, sometimes it kind of worked. I temporarily would forget. I would, for example, invest myself into work heavily or yeah. something, uh, and just be somewhere at the back of my mind, not that active, or as I said. Uh, when entering a new relationship, it also subsided. So, but as I also mentioned, it kind of over years, it grew in intensity. So I was afraid that, yeah, I, may, I might end up as someone who transitions at 40, for example. Hmm. Okay. And there were quite a lot of stories about people who, yeah, transition about that age, 40s, yeah. 50s after suppressing their identity for, for almost a lifetime. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that had a problem of not being authentic, of not being who I am. Of Well, the main problem with that desistance is that, yeah, I'm just essentially hiding a big part of my personality, not showing, not letting it live and uh, at that time i would say uh, my person my identity itself like it, i was kind of roughly estimating it that i, w I was feeling like 70 percent female 30 percent male something like that, a mix okay. of that and it was a significant portion of my identity which i just couldn't show couldn't x so yeah and this yeah. is uh late late 20s 
early 30s. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And after having this for so many years, like I was suffering for 14 years at least from that, I didn't think that it will go away by itself. Yeah. So I did. I had this need to do something about it. Yeah. And uh, and even then, even then, did you? Uh, I mean, were you role playing on the internet? Uh, this is a time of MMO RPGs are coming up, and there's more and more uh, social media. Uh, yeah, I've done some of that. Yeah. So. Uh, but not heavily invested, as I said, I was a bit shy of social contacts, even okay. online. Okay. So before going on, this might be a bit good point to reflect. And because at that point, I think I was really understanding what transgender activists are currently saying and uh, so yeah my situation at that time was yeah i from all the information that i gathered well i had only two options to play with so either pay a high cost and transition but be authentic to myself or continue to deny it, but eventually I might just succumb it to it anyway. Yeah. And uh, uh, if someone from the side would have come to me at that time and said, hey, you know, we're going to make it so that this cost, uh, it can be lessened. Okay. What if that society were more accepting towards people like you? Uh, what if, you know, there was less social stigma of going out like cross rest. What if uh, you were more accepted? And what if we went and fixed all those things for you so you would be more comfortable? Uh, you could be who you really are? Because I, yeah, I was pretty convinced at that time that yeah, I'm some, I should be a woman. And uh, yeah, if someone came and said it to me, it would be quite attractive. Yeah. And uh, it might have been that extra push that I needed at that time in order to go over to that first option. Yeah, okay. And I think these people have really good intentions in that regard, because as far as I know, mm, and at, especially at that time, well, there is no third option. There is no treatment that could just make those feelings go away. And uh, living a life of desistance is not a good life. Like uh, constantly suppressing who you are. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So... Yeah, and uh, yeah, when those people are also, <laughs> well, there is, I think, some confusion currently about when they say that uh, this biology doesn't matter. What matters is, you know, how do you identify, etc. Yeah. I think uh, what I would have made of it is that we are not talking about science we're not talking about biology we're talking about quality of life so whenever someone says yeah trans women are women it doesn't mean those biological facts it means that there is kind of this big umbrella of womanhood and big umbrella of manhood and uh, it's about belonging under that umbrella so yeah. even if i don't check mm -hmm. all the boxes and I don't have all the necessary uh, kind of plumbing over there in places or I don't look like a woman, I can still be a woman. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. Um, just to interject uh, into that conversation, 
if society can be more accepting of the autogynophilic male or the male who's uh, persistently pressured from within uh, to be perceived or to live as a woman, there's still that umbrella still uh, would sacrifice safeguards for women. And you can't necessarily force women to be attracted to men who want to be women, right? Right now we're seeing yeah. the dating apps for lesbians are completely overrun by men who are saying that they're lesbians, right? And it's like, it's a competing uh, rights issue, right? There's women's rights and trans or autogonophile rights. So it, I think that there might be a solution, but we have to be really honest with uh, safeguarding, you know, not putting in the extreme case, not allowing men to go into women's prisons. Right. Um, and what, what do you do with the showers? What do you do with the bathrooms? What do you do with these private spaces? Does the man, the autogynophile, the autogynophile need to be accepted on that level? Or is there like a third option where men on our side can be less bullying and, and more accepting of men who have the proclivity to engage with the world in a more feminine way, right? Yeah, I agree with you that um, there is, uh, yeah, there is a line which you shouldn't cross when you start to impeding on other people's right. So, yeah. uh, but at that time, I was what I was not thinking about that at all. I was thinking mostly about my problems. And I think uh, that's a bit of, um, unfortunately, mindset of many activists. They also just think about that problem and uh, don't look at that yeah, bigger picture. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, you can easily justify this uh, with, um, well, let's push for maximum power, so for maximum effect, even if this might be ridiculous a bit sometimes and over the top, but uh, it's better to push for more and get some feedback. You still yeah. win more territory rather yeah. than being humble and just asking for little. Yeah. yeah. So I believe, yeah, there is something of that. Yeah. Yeah. The political sphere, which again, well, not again in this conversation, but over all of my channel, the political is a different beast than the personal. The political might convince some people that that's the solution, but your story is showing the deep personal nature of this and how that would translate into politics uh, without losing that humanity or without just becoming completely about power. Um, is is another thing to avoid or to resist a little bit and kind of one of the purposes of my channel on a political level is to kind of let those two things get a little bit more space between them i think there is a bridge somewhere between this personal experience and that political movement that is happening and it was probably laid by people who were you know, like me having intense experiences and uh, they could benefit it from better society and when they finally let it known and uh, some people from political sphere okay got that message and then i think it got a bit into self-amplification loop eventually mm. and it got out of control eventually which is where we are now <laughs> a little out of control <laughs> I have a few thoughts on that, uh, which I would, will share later. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So this was a bit of detail into yeah. this activism. Uh, okay. So my next chapter was, yeah, I was 28 at that time. And uh, this is where it all ties up. Kind of. Uh, um, yeah, you asked me about being religious. So, uh, 
I was religious and uh, I think I have to pay due respect yeah, when where respect is due. So one day, I just like that, I was praying and uh, I was asking God for guidance. I said, well, you know, this is too hard for me. I just can't make it out on myself. I don't know what to do, which way to go. Can you, you know, bring me some enlightenment, some help, actually? And uh, it was not the first time I was doing this, but that one time, some, yeah, 14 years ago, uh, I felt an answer. I just felt instantly after that that somehow my plea was heard, kind of registered, and I got this intense feeling all over my body that, okay, we'll take care of this. And I was like, after this short prayer, I was suddenly 100% confident that it will be solved somehow. I didn't know how, I didn't know what, but it was like total confidence. And it was such an amazing feeling like, you know, I, I would say, I, I didn't know that it's possible to communicate that level. Like, you know, you are not supposed to hear back from God. <laughs> <laughs> it's like um yeah what, praying for me is like yeah talking to a, a phone set uh, which doesn't have any signal on the other side but just you know talking talking and maybe someone's listening some not and at that time i was i heard that there is something and that's how it started and then a year, oh, sorry, a week later, something amazing happened. Uh, I, I met a girl, and I immediately knew that she's the answer. But like that. I don't know how, again. And uh, it was, yeah, unconscious feeling. And I tried to get to know that girl. And it appeared that we had striking similarities. And in ways we think, in ways we do things. She was from my hometown. She had the same birthday, like only seven years uh, before. Uh, so she was younger than me. Uh, we went to the same school. We were kind of doing the same choices for our college degrees, etc. Huh. We like the same music. It was just amazing. And I suddenly realized something when I was interacting with her, that this is how I would have lived my life if I were a woman. Huh. And she was right here in front of me, like in a very physical manifestation. And uh, just, I was stunned. It was like uh, God saying to me, you know, there is someone already living life of a woman over here in this earth, and you have a different purpose. Hmm. So that's how I interpreted her. But... You know, these cheesy stories about meeting your other half, like romantically. So this was as close to me as I as it can get, I believe. <laughs> I was just instant in love. I just, um, uh, whenever, we still meet from time to time, but whenever I'm with her, it's like, I don't want to be anywhere else. I just, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. here and totally grounded and totally, and most myself also feel. And uh, yeah, so we started just interacting. 
and uh, um, exchanging maybe thoughts, ideas. I was very, uh, as I said, struck with feelings and emotions to from, but it was not mutual again. So mm. she was not feeling that uh, towards me. But through her, I discovered uh, some things which eventually led to me overcoming this um, transgender issue that I had. But it was yeah, a gradual process. And I think uh, the most uh, three, so I had three influential ideas that came through her. And uh, one uh, was she introduced me to works of uh, Carl Gustav Jung, Jung, mm. sorry. So, um, and yeah, boy, that man was a genius kind of when I read some of his work. Uh, but what mostly struck me uh, were a few things. So he laid a kind of a sort of map of cognitive functions. For, so like uh, things like uh, feelings, thought processes, sensory input, uh, intuition. And uh, some people then made some of those character types from that yeah. uh, theory. And uh, when I discovered that, I was very relieved because this allowed to explain my kind of character traits in a non-sexual way. So, yeah, as I told, I was kind of sensitive. I was feeling very intensely. But uh, it was okay because, yeah, it's, it turns out that it's kind of universal mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. for people to have. Only maybe, yeah, males on average have it less expressed. Females have it more maybe expressed. But it's only on average. And uh, it can still be, yeah, a sensitive male, and that's okay. Well, it's kind of necessary. <laughs> we need sensitive men. Yeah, uh, but for me, it was kind of a new revelation. Uh, yeah, that I can have those feelings and I can still and can still be okay. That I don't need to transition to being a woman in order to have emotions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it might be elementary at this point in time when, but at that time, it was a big uh, revelation for me. Mm. And uh, I noticed that often, actually, yeah, people who consider transition, they kind of explain that by some very stereotypical um, ways, like, yeah, what does it mean to be feminine? Oh, I, I can be more emotional, etc. But yeah, you can be just as emotional being a man. Mm -hmm. And uh, Okay, so that was an interesting thing. Another thing that I discovered was um, a book called Male Sexuality, uh, which... Do you know who's the author or the authors? I can, yeah. I that sounds this. like an academic text. Michael Bader, uh, in 2008, published. Barber? B A R B E R? Uh, no, Bader. B A D E R. Cool, thank you. I think it's a Canadian doctor uh, of psychology. And uh, at that time, I was yeah, reading a bit more about yeah, sexuality, about uh, differences. And this book was a revelation for me. And, uh, and it had one very powerful message, uh, which essentially said that all men have a kind of sheer and unconscious guilt of being distant from women. And uh, the way it happens is that when boys grow, 
into puberty, and they have to differentiate themselves from their mothers, from women. They have to yeah, become men, and they and they have kind of to tie, well, to cut those ties towards femininity, and they feel unconscious guilt for that, which then they later try to compensate for. So basically, men deep inside, they feel guilty of just being a man towards a woman, because they can hurt that woman. Uh, they uh, so yeah, I would really recommend reading that book. It's hmm. discussed in very deep way. So that that power differential between male and female uh, can feed into a guilt complex. That... Definitely. Okay. And some people, even yeah, some men, actually try to kind of um, eradicate this power differential by just. Yeah, uh, by either pleasing women, women, or by uh, kind of lowering their masculinity as much as they as possible, like not being proud of as a man or something. I think this is tied to a phenomenon that is currently raging. Well, maybe it's a bit past, but this is called toxic masculinity. Hmm. So I think this is where it comes from. Uh, an inner sense, well, that I can hurt a woman just by being a man. Hmm. And it just, I deeply resonated with this statement at that time. And uh, it just, yeah, for me, it was yeah, bullseye. Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. And, uh, but then again, it was strange that, okay, I am connecting to entire male gender through this, like through this guilt, which I was never expecting to have a connection through this. Um, so, so your tie to masculinity was fraught. You couldn't accept masculinity because of this guilt that you had? Is that what you're saying? Like there was a distance between you embracing or accepting your manhood because of a guilt or because of a severance or a, a distance from women? It was not, so initially it was not conscious level. It was just you know, feeling and uh, I think I always felt it that, yeah, somehow I didn't want to be to become a man because yeah I didn't want to hurt women. This is one of those probably mm -hmm. justifications that I had in the back of my mind that mm -hmm. well men are hurtful, that men are cruel, men are angry um, and I don't want to be like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, but as I said, uh, the real surprise was me that this is, was the first link, kind of concrete evidence, okay, of my connections to male, being male, and through such an uh, unexpected, like, detour. And, um, yeah, so that was it. And then I think the final piece of the puzzle for me was uh, discovering another little book called uh, Leadership and Self-Deception. That's hmm. the, the self-deception. Leadership and Leadership self and self-deception. Okay. It's uh, written by, published by Arbinger Institute. And uh, it's actually not it's about sexuality at all. <laughs> it's about, it's kind of a business book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, it's uh, based on two theories. 
uh, and they kind of nicely merged those two theories into one. So the first is about self-deception in general. So um, I don't know how much you know about it. Um, I don't know anything. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, well, regular deception is something uh, when we try actively to deceive other people, right? By lying or masking our intentions or usually with some intent. And uh, the problem with this type of deception is that it's quite costly because you have to maintain kind of two realities in your head, the one that you're communicating and the one that is real for you. And it can be detected because other people have detectors, lie detectors, uh, and they can read your body language. They can read subtle nuances and see well through you. And uh, self-deception kind of does it a step further when you not only deceive other people, but you also deceive yourself of something. And then the deception becomes complete because if you believe in that thing completely, then everything that you communicate about it, it's genuine. So other people cannot detect the deception. Mm -hmm. And uh, So you're living the lie quite literally. Yes. Yeah. And it's something that's um, unique to humans probably. I'm not sure. Maybe animals have some sort of it, but... Uh, mm. it, it comes with a big cost. I mean, so explain, like, so you said the social costs of, of deceiving other people, but what, what's the cost of self-deception? Uh, cognitive dissonance, uh, a distance from yourself, an inauthentic, inauthenticity that's growing and growing, or a pressure like that? So when you are self inside self-deception, you don't have cognitive dissonance. You okay. don't have uh, those negative things that are associated with simple deception. But of course, uh, the price that you pay is that, okay, you don't see the world as it is. You kind of have, <laughs> I don't know, uh, hmm. some examples could be people who believe conspiracy theories or flat earth. Uh, uh, well, they have a whole worldview around it about some ideas which are demonstrably not true, but they still continue living without them, uh, within them. And uh, I think the worst case of self-deception are wars like actual human wars. The value of humans? No, no. Uh, the kind of, when people become involved in a war, like, yeah. no, something like Russia and Ukraine are doing apparently. Yeah, apparently. Uh, <laughs> yes, and that's where there is ultimate expression of self-deception, because mm. each side believes that they are right that they are defending something, some values of their own, et cetera. They, um, both Russians and Ukrainians in this case, they have solid justification for the, what they are doing. Otherwise, they won't be doing it. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, they live like in separate worldviews, separate kind of yeah. mindsets, and therefore they can't communicate. They can't really get together. And um, I think I just want to interject because we are on the to topic of Russia. I think Chernobyl would be a great example of self-deception or an entire, an entire society that's suffering from self-deception and the inability to uh, adequately assess reality because there was yeah. so much deception and self-deception throughout the entire chain that when even leading up to the disaster and responding to the disaster was completely blocked by all that deception that was going on yes all the power politics there. yeah it had a lot of and there is still self-deception a lot i think in the world 
not only in Russia, but in, uh, no, in the United States, well. too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, we, we, yeah, there's a lot of dual realities battling it out, even in the gender uh, conversation. Yes. And uh, apparently that self-deception mechanism have some positive traits from evolutionary point of view. Therefore, it exists because, yeah, when you are very sure of something, it gives you extra motivation, extra power to do that. And uh, even if it allows to start a war, well, still, if you win that war, this is kind of yeah. favorable towards you. And this is uh, why they say that, you know, history is written by the winners. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so that's one side. Then the other idea that was behind that book was um, uh, taken from a philosopher, uh, Martin Buber, who lived like 100 years ago. And uh, he had this uh, theory of dialect and uh, of dialogue. And uh, it comes to two basic points. So uh, whenever two people are in conversation, they can be in two modes. So it can be I, you relationship. That means that uh, when people are engaged like that, there is openness, uh, there is mutual respect, uh, there is a possibility to change each other's opinion because each is open towards what the other is saying. There is uh, also emotions that, well, everything uh, just, you know, flows between people. I think it's, I guess, something like what we are doing right now, having a dialogue about intimate topics and each one is interested in the other. And then there is another kind of relationship, which is called I-it relationship. This is more when we treat others in a more non-personal way. Yeah, 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 transactional way. It's uh, yeah, when you go to a shop and you know just check out at the cashier or something, or similar. And when you are in this state, you are much more prone to see people maybe as objects, as functions, and you can easily get angry, for example, if that person misbehaves. And uh, yeah, so kind of two alternative ways to be in life. Yeah. And I think most of us prefer this first way because it's much more satisfactory much more humane way of living life but we also have lots of relationships where this is a bit more transactional way anyway so these guys uh, Barbinger, they had this kind of genius idea that okay um how they kind of try to answer how do people enter the self-deceptive state? And their answer was, you enter self-deception whenever you switch from I-you relationship to I-it relationship. And uh, that's when you are starting treating other people not exactly as people, and you try them and then you begin to kind of uh, attribute things towards those people. Okay, you, you try to guess their motivations instead of asking them directly. Okay. So you might come to assumption, oh, that person is being mean because he said that and that, hmm. uh, etc. And at first it's subtle, but it's kind of the trigger that switches. And then okay. it can go bigger and bigger and bigger as time and the problem is that it's self-reinforcing so kind of if uh, uh, how you can fall from into that self-deception is um, 
most often, as they say, that it comes through self-betrayal. But what does it mean is that whenever we are in some kind of relationship and you have a genuine need, which you express, and I simply deny that need. And then I have to justify for myself, okay, why did I do that? And uh, I might come with some various uh, explanations. Maybe one explanation, well, I was tired, I needed you know, rest, that's why I was rude to, towards you. Or maybe another explanation, you didn't deserve it. Or maybe you're a bad person for doing that. And uh, if I act on that r rationalization, then I would inadvertently become a somewhat rude towards you. And then you would react to that and you become rude towards my me. And that I would treat as a further justification for my initial uh, assumption of you. And this just can go in circles round and round until people become completely estranged and don't talk for years. Mm -hmm. Or you have the political climate of America in the present day. I would say, yeah, I see a lot of, of signs of this self-deception going on in that political climate. It's basically, yeah, when there is no direct communication and each side is vilifying the other one, and uh, that uh, other side uses that as justification for their own vilification of that other and just... It just mm -hmm. amplifies uh, until mm -hmm. it explodes eventually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so yeah, so that's how you get into self deception, according to them. And uh, the way out of self deception. Oh, but before that, uh, one important thing which really got me thinking and which was kind of the whole idea behind this is okay how does one experience self-deception so uh, self-deception comes in form of thoughts so yeah i might be having thoughts which just doesn't align with reality and uh, then i would be searching for evidence uh, which would support my vision. And I would be very selective. So I would only accept those uh, facts or pseudo facts uh, which support uh, my view of the world, but I would reject those who do not. Uh, I would also, it impairs, so self deception also impairs perception because I would simply just ignore. Uh, contradicting evidence. And uh, the most important thing for me was that self-deception can also create feelings. So whenever I, so um, we had, yeah, we discussed potential situation, for example, how this evolves. And if I were in, uh, in this deceptive state towards you, then I would actually feel some genuine feelings. I would feel anger, maybe. I would feel disgust um, by another person. And it's not faked feelings, that real emotions that I would feeling very viscerally all over my body. And, and then it kind of dawned on me, you know, this feeling of me wanting to be a woman it's just that, a feeling. How do I know if it's true or not? And uh, is it possible that I am in this self-deception state towards yeah, my gender? And uh, maybe that feeling which I'm having, it's just yeah, a manufactured one, even mm -hmm. though it kind of persisted for so long. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, I never questioned that feeling before, but this, at that moment, yeah, after kind of connecting the dots, I started questioning it. But uh, yeah, questioning itself, it's not enough. Because I don't know uh, 
if I am self-deceived at that moment, I don't know how to verify that. Because, uh, yeah, everything is impacted. My thoughts, my emotions, my perception. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't trust basically anything that comes from myself. And uh, I am not able to verify that, if that feeling is genuine or not. Uh, however, fortunately, yeah, as I read that book, there was a way, okay, so how do we get out of self-deception? And uh, the answer is quite simple, actually. If you, if I am in self-deception, then I can do that on my own, but I can rely on other people because they are not affected by it. So if I take cues, I then take, I become receptive towards what other people are saying, I can gradually come out of it. But in order to that, I must become receptive. And find receptive people, because if you are surrounded by people who are believing the same deception or unreality, yes. then, then yes. you can't break out of it until you find people who are receptive. And is that where that I, it slash I, thou relationship comes to bear where you start to open yourself up to a I, you relationship more and more, yes. and then also find people who are engaged in I, you rather than I, it. Yes. So uh, in this case of my own question towards gender, uh, there was no other person involved. And I didn't know how I got into this situation. But uh, what I know, okay, I have my body. And this is kind of another party in this relationship, you know. (laughs) And uh, my relationship with that body was indifferent at best before that. And a bit annoying or even slightly hostile at worst. And I thought, okay, what if I kind of try to improve that relationship? And at that time, it was impossible for me to conceptualize that I could love my body. I just, I felt I could never do that at that moment. But okay, but I decided maybe I could do something less. Maybe I could at least um, acknowledge it, thank it for it being, maybe pay some respect over it take better care of it actively. And I decided to do such an experiment, like, yeah, actively taking better care of my body. This, it reminds me of, uh, I just want to point out that this is a totally different tact than what you had tried before. I'm going to suppress my feelings of wanting to be a woman for a month, but this time you're like, I'm going to take care of my body, you're going to do something positive rather than suppressive, right? But it's still kind of a trial. Yes, just a, it was still a, a trial. Pitch. I was not expecting much from it, actually, at the time. Uh, uh, and I just did that. So actively, like a couple of times a day, I would stop a bit, get in tune what I'm feeling at the moment, say some calming words toward my body, like, I'm here, thank you for being with me, etc. Uh, taking better care, like more sleep, etc. Better hygiene, better mm-hmm. maybe eating habits. And to my great surprise, after two weeks, I suddenly noticed that that feeling that I had, it just decreased in intensity quite a lot. Hmm. So it went like, you know, from six to three. And I just said, oh, my God, it's working. And after that, I continued. And after a month of this self-therapy, basically, it was gone. I reduced to almost inaudible. Hmm. And uh, this was something that kind of, again, blew my mind because I was not expecting to be it that effective. Uh, yeah, it was there for 14 years, and all I did is, you know, some talking to myself for a month and just went away. Hmm. And 
Yeah, and it was incredible. I could breathe like for the first time in years. Yeah, it just reminds me of when you were talking about prayer, uh, like it's just a, a line and the other side's dead, but you got an answer from that other end. Mm -hmm. And it seems like you started to, uh, you know, maybe your body was praying to you through these uh, pressures to want to be a woman and you weren't listening to it correctly. And you kind of just started to be alive on that other end. You started to have a I thou relationship with, uh, with your body. Right. Yeah. And then that resolve. So the, the signals that your body was sending you maybe were, were, just cry for help. It was a prayer um, that came in the form of sexuality, became a form of fantasy. But once you started to just embrace and thank and, and you know talk back to your body, it resolved. Yep. And I was amazed because, well, in everything that I read before, you know, it just doesn't happen. So those... Uh, those feelings just don't go away like that. And uh, I, at that moment, I didn't knew about detransitioners at all. I heard about them years later. But um, anyway, so after this, I think uh, my this male identity, it started rapidly maybe growing, expanding afterwards. And uh, a year later, I was actually in my first intimate relationship, finally. And I thought, I just felt that it's past me. I just finally sold it for myself. Hmm. Uh, there was some interesting side effect of this one. So after, you know, this month initially passed, maybe a month later, I had very strange experience. And hmm, I started noticing male energy somehow with my body. It's strange to describe. Uh, I think a usual mode of know, how men operate in this world, and we just go and meet another man and we try to be, to avoid them and not look into the eyes, etc. We don't feel them at all. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually only pay attention to, well, women if we are attracted to women. Maybe for gay people it's different experience. But anyway, and I just suddenly started noticing men for some reason everywhere. And uh, that uh, experience was that I was not only starting noticing, but there was some kind of feedback inside myself, like electric tingles uh, across hmm. the body or something like that. It was strange, again, nothing that I have experienced before. And uh, it was even annoying, like I couldn't be in a... Uh, place where there were a lot of men because it just started to get overwhelming a bit <laughs> and started avoiding for that reason but it passed maybe in two or three weeks this mm. effect but I, I almost felt shifting something in my body in my brain and that's how eventually i knew that this is permanent you know this um, change that i experienced Hmm. And now, 14 years have passed in that, and uh, yeah, it hasn't hasn't gone back uh, towards uh, my state before. I wouldn't say that it's like um, went completely to zero. There is some maybe. I would say sometimes when I'm really stressed or I'm really. Uh, yeah, don't take care of myself. I suddenly yeah, notice that little, little voice somewhere in the back. But that's when I know, okay, it's, let's stop a little bit. Let's take a breather. Well, that's, um, I know mm. what to do. And it, it always helps reduce and just, again, 
vanishes. Hmm. And I probably... <laughs> you know, by the way, one of the fears that I had those years ago uh, when I was thinking what to do, you know, to transition or not, not to transition, or I was also thinking, okay, what would happen if that feeling just went away? And uh, it somehow felt that I would be losing part of myself because, yeah, that was kind of a big piece of my identity, my personality. And if it just vanished, okay, I would feel empty or something inauthentic. And um, so my result was that I somehow outgrew that. I didn't lose that feminine identity, which I had completely, but it ha somehow became integrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually find quite a lot of uses for that. Mm. It kind of allows me to maybe better understand other people and women in particular. Mm. Uh, it allows me to be more in tune with my emotions, with my feelings. And... Um, yeah. Hmm. It rounds you out. Yeah. So, so I just want to kind of summarize the, the process. So you, you had a, your prayer was answered in, in the respect that you, you saw that woman and saw yourself in her and saw that she saw that there was a female version or close to you outside yeah. um and then you intellectually three main ideas were the Jungian um psychology or analytic psychology or psychoanalytic oh i can never remember what it's called but you, you saw that there's no one way to be a man and that there are just the human personality is divvied up um and distributed uh, and one thing i forgot to mention about that uh, uh, is the concept of anima yeah i was going to ask about that yeah it also kind of nicely explains some things and the anima is uh, the soul or the female side of the male in the union yeah. uh, way of thinking and and so when you found that concept as this neutral concept or this universal concept um, or archetype that is just a part of humanity, then you were able to go back and look at your fictions and your cross-dressing and, and that double life and say, oh, that was just my, that you started to accept that as that's just a part of me. That's not something different than me, but it's just, uh, it's my feminine nature. And, and you were able yeah, to I embrace it. Yeah, I can accept it. it from current point of view. But I probably it was not possible why I was still in self-deception because hmm. I would just explain it, okay, as a, as a proof that I was really female mm -hmm. If, mm -hmm. while being in that. Yeah. So same idea, but, you know, different interpretations. Yeah. And th that idea was able to be more integrated by the male sexuality book by seeing that there were unresolved issues that you had regarding yeah. your sexuality and guilt and separation from the female and fear of being hurtful or harmful to them. Yeah. Yeah. And then that whole I, it self-deception, um, thing started to allow you to, to enter into an I, thou or I, you relationship with yourself first and foremost. Mm -hmm. And, and that eased that self-deception. And then also going through the process of uh, embracing and loving and, you know, I guess being in a relationship with your body, then I, that masculine energy tale or anecdote, it's very interesting that you felt like a vibration around males. You felt like this male energy. And, and can you describe that just a little bit? Because I think I know what you're talking about, but I would like to hear like, um, like what what's the difference between the masculine energy and the feminine energy? Is it like tingling aggressive? Like, is there like, can you, can you make it more sensory or, or make like kind of a metaphor for well, it? Well, 
that episode was. So if I were like in the same room, yeah, with other men, and the closer they get to me, like physically, the more intense that would feel and like little electric tingling somewhere inside the body. Mm. And w and that wasn't around women. Did you pick up on women's? Uh, no, energy? actually not. Okay. Huh. One wonders if women kind of subconsciously feel that about men. Uh, sorry, can you repeat? I, it, one wonders if um, women aren't particularly attuned to what you're talking about with male energy, and um, that's why it's important to keep language as it is, so that m women can call a man a man because of that energy is perceptible to them. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, I don't know yeah, how females experience that male energy. Yeah. I was a bit panicked at that time, by the way. I would go, am I turning gay or something? But mm -hmm. it didn't turn out that way, <laughs> actually. It, it, so that ebbed away. Yeah. Or it... it, it relaxed mm -hmm. yeah and then it just faded away eventually now yeah yeah so that's my story and so not being it just seems like there's such a sunk cost to having to bear that weight for so long what what was given to you in the way of freedom and ability to do other things and and pay attention to the world in a different way without having to spend so much energy on this autogynophilia or whatever? Oh, so I would say, so first of all, I think it allowed my main identity, like as a man, to grow up and expand because it was really constricted and uh, Hmm. Yeah, when I had this constant like um, thing removed, which was eating a lot of attention and energy to suppress it, I could invest yeah that energy in actually yeah becoming more self confident and uh, hmm. being in that relationship with women, with intimate relationship, because I was no longer afraid that I would be found out or what mm. I'm not, or whatever. I could just be and experience things as they are. And eventually, yeah, it led that, yeah, I can have an intimate relationship, but someone can love me just as like I am. Mm. And yeah, I have a loving life, uh, wife currently. Uh, yeah, who knows about more my adventures into that. And mm. yeah, she just accepts that. And so going back to the political discussion, is there some insight that um, you'd like to add to the conversation around what's called trans rights or uh, the political side of sexuality? It's kind of captured the imagination of uh, so much for politics right now. Well, uh, as we spoke before, and I said, yeah, we can come back to this later. I can uh, understand the positive aspect of that push for trans rights, etc. Uh, but yes, there is also a negative thing, and there is a dark side. And uh, what I believe is that this self-deception got a bit into the wild and then there are yeah, groups of people who are kind of living it and uh, they advocate for those more rights more resources towards that but the problem here fundamentally so well considering my situation so uh, my situation was well, something that could be described yeah, by this autogenophilia concept. Mm. 
probably best. Mm -hmm. uh, but it still was quite serious and quite um, impactful mm -hmm. on life. And I know for sure that some people with similar condition, they go actually into transition and they pay that high cost. And um, it begs me to ask a question, okay, are there other ways for those people? So if I was able to find a way, maybe those people could other also find something. Maybe there could be alternative therapies for them. Like the one that I have described, I think those steps are quite easy to reproduce for other people and they could try it. And uh, well, there is this push towards affirmation therapy, as far as I know, quite widely in the West. And what is affirmation therapy, in essence, is it's when a therapist says, yes, you are right. Those feelings that you have inside, they are the true feelings, and let's, you know, free them. Let's make uh, you who you are supposed to be, because uh, these feelings are the true identity. And uh, as I said, I too could have fallen for such a push if it was at that time. Uh, and looking back, I would say that it would have been a big mistake for me to go hmm. that way. Hmm. Because currently, as I live li my life, I'm well, relatively quite happy and satisfied with being who I am, with all the social relationship that I have, with impact yeah, around me, with my career, etc. And uh, if I would have gone the other way, yeah, I would have lost it all, and I would probably be quite miserable right now. Hmm. There is a. Uh... So those people with good intentions, they're pushing this, I think, some people towards harm because they're reinforcing this illusion for them. Well, there are certain aspects of uh, activist culture, specifically within the trans rights activist culture online that one could describe as toxic and one can see that they have to act in a certain way and squash dissent and, and tell other people what not to say and how to speak to them because they need constant reinforcement of, uh, of their reality. And that shows to me that if you constantly need other people reinforcing your reality and squashing anybody questioning it, that your realities it's, it, that's weak behavior. That means that your reality is weak. It, it needs belief. It's based on belief. And therefore, if it can't stand on its own, it's probably, you're probably noticing something about it being deceptive or being unstable, right? Because yeah. reality will, doesn't need people to believe in it, right? Reality yeah. will withstand people's doubt and, you know, uh, bend it, bend them to its will. Right. So. Yeah. Eventually, I think it, probably will resolve itself because that delusion can be maintained indefinitely. Well, it just becomes more and more costly. It becomes more and more expensive. Yeah, but at some point it becomes maybe too expensive or too self-contradictory and uh, hmm. but it can take a long time for it to be resolved. Yeah. And another negative outcome of this uh, activism is that uh, now, those people are suppressing well, scientific research into this field because it has become so toxic that yeah, no sane intellectual wants to go there and do research on how to develop new therapy, new maybe understandings of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Because if you just publish incorrect something not aligned with activist worldview, you can be in serious trouble. Mm -hmm. So that's that. Hmm. 
And okay, so one more question because I, I didn't square this. What did that book on self deception and leadership have to do with leadership? We didn't get to there. Like, what's the what's the key to leadership there? And I, I'm wondering if that's one way that the politics around this issue can be changed by having actual leadership and using their model. So, what was the, their key to leadership in that? Well, their approach was that. Um... <sighs> Leaders, in order to lead efficiently, they have to um, kind of notice and uh, uh, counter self-deception as it appears. Otherwise, they will be leading blind in circles or into some bad places. So, uh, and yeah, that book actually taught the theory on how to notice it how does one feels when inside of it and what to do about it and it, did it lay out uh, tips and tricks for ending self-deception in other people like well, what's the proper way to do that do you model honesty or do you actually confront the self-deception like how do you decrease self-deception in your team or in your immediate circle um the most effective way is try to, well, move the conversation as much as possible into this I-you relationship. And that means um, opening up towards other person's reality, however warped it might be. And uh, try to understand, okay, what makes those people tick? Try to accept what they are feeling as genuine and um, mm -hmm. i just you know the first thing that it came to my mind is something a story i had it in i heard in conference a few years ago i think there was a woman from us uh, talking about her <laughs> relationship with her neighbors who were trump supporters at that time, like hardcore MAGA, and she was very liberal. And uh, she, but she said, you know, I wanted to understand them, and I just tried talking to them and kind of asking their opinion, etc. And she said, well, eventually it kind of improved our relationship. And those her neighbors said, oh, she gets me; she is able to listen to me. And they started to respect her back. Hmm. So that's, I think, one path of how you can move out of it. Hmm. Hmm. That's uh, great advice. Um, very commonsensical, uh, which is something that we've kind of lost in this current time. Andreas, thank you so much for sharing your story and being so open with uh, such personal details. Is there... You say you do writing. Do you have a blog? Is there some way that people can uh, follow up on you or follow you online? Well, as I mentioned, some of those things that I was talking were somewhat controversial, so I don't want to be hunted by activists. Therefore, I don't want mm. uh, direct um, uh, things to what I'm doing. Uh, but if someone would like to reach out to me, I just created a special email just for that. And it's uh, clarity.river at gmail.com. Clarity.river at gmail.com. Yeah. And uh, I would be very interesting if someone else would try this like technique that I described. Maybe it would work for them. Maybe it won't. Uh, mm -hmm. Or maybe some researcher would like to talk about how it can be developed. Mm -hmm. I think it might have some potential here because, well, if it worked for me, I think maybe it can work for other people as well. Maybe it, I, I don't assume it would work well for everyone because I think there are genuinely transgender people who, for whom transition is really the best way and but maybe this could be for example helpful as a screening hmm. towards uh, so mm -hmm. 
that's it. And um, yeah, thank you for hosting me on your channel. I kind of thought that it would be a good place to share that story. No, it's excellent. It's excellent. So thank you.